Yes. As you can see, I'm a child of the 80s. I was born in 1980. I had that full decade all to myself, I think, sometimes. And those were the shows I grew up with, and they're better than anything you said. So, um, <laughs> yes, there we, there we go. So, and I'm not judging you if your decade was like the 50s or the 60s or 70s, but the 80s is where it was at. And if your decade was the 2000s, just... Don't even mention, we're not talking about what was cool five years ago, okay? So just deal with it. Um, and I don't know if you guys know this, but just one other thing that's amazing about the 80s is that MacGyver is actually from Roseville. Did, did anyone know this? He's pretty much the man, right? If you read his like biography, which I got into and read this week, uh, apparently he wanted to be a professional hockey player when he was growing up. And over a two-week span, in two different occurrences, he broke both arms One and then the other, and basically said, all right, maybe I'm done with hockey, and the rest is history, right? Um, And I think I actually had this real nostalgic view of the shows from the 80s, and I thought they were just amazing because I grew up on them, and when I was eight, I probably liked everything and didn't know any better. Um, And then there was this invention, uh, you know, a couple years ago, maybe some of you have heard of this thing called Netflix. Yeah, um, that ruined everything for me because when I went back to watch some of these shows that I had thought were amazing and I turned them on and I, the theme song comes on and I'm da na da na da na 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 da na na and then it starts and you realize David Hasselhoff is like the worst actor in the world. <laughs> the, the show has no plot. I mean, it is like the dumbest thing in the world. And I maybe got through like two episodes before my entire view of them was ruined, Right? And then I was like, okay, maybe it's just this one. And I went back and watched The A-Team, and it was awful. And I went back and watched. Uh, don't, don't do it, by the way. If you think those shows are great, please never watch them again. Just let that, let that belief stick in there. And I realized 80s TV, uh, incredibly trendy and awful. Uh, it does not stand the test of time. And I started to think about that compared to 80s movies, because I feel completely different about 80s movies. Right? 80s movies still are amazing, right? You, you, you turn on Ferris Bueller's Day Off. You turn on Indiana Jones, Back to the Future, The Goonies I watched the other day, Top Gun, man. Like, and the list goes on and on and on. You got, you, know, you got all these amazing action stars and you got all these incredible movies and they stand the test of time, man. They're like, they had the, the best budgets, the best producers, the best writers. They, most of them had decent actors, which TV wasn't afforded back then. It wasn't as high of a medium. They didn't invest in it as much. And so the movies are timeless, but the TV was super, super trendy. And as you look at it now, the stuff that's timeless remains. You want to rewatch it. You want to reinvest in it. You want to continue to pay attention to it, to rewatch it. And the stuff that's trendy, you just go back and you think, how did that ever make any sense? Like, why do we like that? And I think it's because I was eight and I didn't know any better. And we're going to be talking about faith for the next eight weeks. And the thing that I hope really comes through is that our faith really should be timeless, right? The same faith that God is looking for from his people today is the same faith that was on display 5,000 years ago and 4,000, 3,000, and 100 years ago. It doesn't matter when you are in history, God has never changed What he expects from his people doesn't change. And we need to have a timeless faith when we serve a timeless God. What pleases him never changes. And faith is one of those things I think that's built on a relationship. And so this is why sometimes I think it's hard for people to really wrap their arms around and understand exactly what faith is because it's very personal. It's very much wrapped into a relationship and it's very hard sometimes to give um, sort of this definition that's all-encompassing for everybody. Let me, just, let me just give you an example. Think about in your life the people who you have the most faith in, okay? Not necessarily on the same level that you look at with God, but the people in your life that you trust, that you believe in, that you know how they're going to respond, that you, you kind of know what to expect from them, right? You know their character. You know that you can rely on them. Think about those people. And I want you to think, those people are probably the people that you're closest to, Right? The, the person that stands out for me, obviously, for me, is my wife. I've known her 11 years. We've been married almost nine years now. We have experienced life together. We have 
11 years of shared experience. We've moved across the country. We've created children. We've done all kinds of stuff. We've gone through ups and downs. We've dealt with life together, all of it, all together. Now I kind of know where she's going to be, what makes her tick, how most of the time she's going to react, what is going to please her, what is going to not please her, what she needs from me, what I'm looking for from her. Like We have this kind of worked out because we have this shared experience through this very intimate relationship. And the same thing could apply to a parent, to a friend, you know, to a brother or sister, whoever you have in your life that you have faith in, that you, you, you probably, it's because you have a, somewhat of an intimate relationship with them. And it, it's really, honestly, no different with, with God. You know, we're going to spend eight weeks talking about what faith looks like. We're going to look at, like, literal examples from the Bible that come out of the Old Testament. And in each one, each one of these people, the reason that they have the faith they have is because over a long period of time, they developed an intimate relationship with God. And I want you to know that I'm not going to necessarily, you know, give you some kind of groundbreaking new concept. I'm going to basically point back to the Bible and what it says on how we find faith in God. And it is built over shared experiences, over an intimate relationship over a period of time. That's how faith gets built. And so as we look across, um, at the, the examples that we have, right, we're going to talk about different people, right? And like some of those people, like Enoch, for instance, it says that he walked with God, that he was an upright man. And it says one day he went for a walk with God and never came back. He didn't even experience death. Is built out of his relationship with God. We're going to look at Moses. And we think, oh, Moses did this amazing stuff. But you know what? He walked around the, the desert hurting for 40 years out there by himself before he ever saw a burning bush. We're going to look at Abraham, who got to know God on, over a long period of time as he was moved around like a nomad, right? And he had to rely on God and was kind of forced to spend his time sort of relying and getting to know God in a very intimate way. Even David, who was sort of a man after God's own heart, right? You look at the amount of time he spent as a, a shepherd singing to God and getting to know him, okay? And all these people that we're potentially going to look at or that are in this chapter of, of Hebrews that we're going to look at, all of their, their legendary faith or the stuff that gets pulled out of this that really tells you what God commended about their faith, it's really built out of this very intimate relationship. I think sometimes we think like, I could never be like Moses. You know, he, he held a staff out and parted an ocean so that way the Israelites could walk across dry land and escape Egypt. But what we don't think about is the fact that he spent 40 years out there in the desert and then had a conversation with a burning bush and then went into Egypt and defied the most powerful man in the world day after day after day after day. And he watched God do things that made absolutely zero sense, except for the fact that it was God. And by the time he got to that place, he had such faith in, that God was going to save the Israelites, that it was going to be one way or the other. Either the earth was going to open up and swallow the Egyptians, or that ocean was going to part. And when God said, hold that staff out and part the waters, he did it and he had the faith for it because it was built up over a long period of time. And I think if you're looking for a quick fix to your faith, you will not find it. This is a, 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 a solid, timeless faith that is continually growing, that is fully developed, is developed over time in relationship through intimacy. Because God has never changed his expectations for his followers, they do not change. And what pleases him will never change. We serve a timeless God. We need a timeless faith. And that's pretty much what we're going to be talking about for the next eight weeks. Today, we're actually going to look at the beginning of the chapter that we'll be spending our time in for the whole series. And it's chapter 11 of the book of Hebrews, okay? And so I want to give you the background of what Hebrews is about and how we get to that place um, just so you can kind of understand where the author is coming from, where the people who read it, kind of how they were seeing it. 
And the book of Hebrews is a very interesting book. It was written to the Jews who were quite religious, who were used to kind of the rules and regulations and rituals that come along with being a Jew, right? They were used to following rules and being within the bounds of a religion. And then Jesus came and he kind of, you know, updated, he kind of flipped all that on its head and he kind of finalized God's whole plan, right? So from the beginning of history to when Jesus came, there was this plan in motion the whole time. And the Jews didn't necessarily see the fact that Jesus was exactly what God had always planned. And so some of the Jews were actually having a hard time. They maybe had heard about Jesus. They maybe even had like a, 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 a beginning of a relationship with him, but they were starting to drift back into religion, back into rules, back into rituals where they were comfortable following through on the guidelines that were placed on them by their priests, by the temple, by the way that they worshiped. They said, we love Jesus. We're a little uncomfortable with grace. And so like, we're just going to just take another step back towards being religious Jewish people and another step back towards being religious Jewish people. And the author of Hebrews is basically saying to the Jews, you guys are missing this, man. Let me, let me go back and just build the case from the beginning. Jesus, you know, he didn't say, I, I've come to abolish the law. He said, I came to fulfill the law. So the law is not gone. It's just been updated. It's just the, the, the final piece is now in place. And I want you to see the whole picture. And so he spends the first 10 chapters connecting the dots for all the Jews to where they understand that Jesus is exactly what they've been waiting for. He's why they were doing all those rituals. He's what the temple was about. He's why they had those priests who were doing the stuff that they were doing. He is literally the the person of the religion that they were practicing. And he says, Jesus is more powerful than Moses, than priests, than angels, than he is the picture of why you did all these rituals. He is the picture of where all these rules came from. He is exactly what God intended for everyone to be. And the Jews, they had gotten so far from what their ancestors had and from what God wanted for them. They had turned this personal relationship that God had with his people into this set of rules and guidelines and rituals and religion. And you know what? The, the, the Jews, they could get close to God. They could go into the temple, but he was always just another step away. He was always one more court away or one more door or he was just through the curtain or he was just far enough away that you couldn't really get to him. And you had these mediators, these priests that would do all the work for you. You would kind of worship through them and through the rituals that you did and through this religious system and all these rules. And they had gotten really, really far from what God had intended. And when Jesus comes, he flips everything on its head. And he says, it's not about all this stuff. It's about relationship. No longer do you have to go in and just be one more step removed from God. The new temple is wherever you are. The new priest is Jesus Christ. And you can now walk boldly into God's throne room and be in his presence through your relationship with Jesus. You can now have all of your sins forgiven in a moment by putting your faith in Jesus. You can now become who God has called you to be because he's equipped you with the Holy Spirit. It's the last final piece that the Jews weren't necessarily putting together. And I think they were far off from what God wanted, and it was painful for God to watch. They were so close, and yet still so far away from knowing this thing that God wanted for them. And we, I mean, it's not so much different for us. We can drift back into doing things out of some sort of responsibility or feeling like we have to, or going through the motions for another person. Potentially we're going to church to make our marriage easier or to please our mom or our dad. Or maybe we're just going through the motions here, we put a smile on our face and we're polite and we act like everything's okay. And in reality, we're still that much further away. We're still one court away, one door away, one curtain away from actually being in relationship with God for ourselves. And I, I just want to stop and say, if, if you're in that place, like you're welcome to be here. We want everyone to be here. And no matter where you are in your journey, like where you go ahead and be comfortable with where you are. I don't want you to feel bad for being in that place. But at some point, if you want this 
to matter, if you want to have faith in Jesus for yourself, if you want to know what it means to live this life that God has called you to live, if you want to have meaning in your life and purpose, you have to take the step of faith for yourself. You have to say, I'm in this not for this other person, not because I feel like I have to, not because I feel like I owe God something, but because I am going to put my faith in Jesus and start this personal relationship for myself. And that is where our faith is born. That's where our faith starts to grow. It's in this relationship we have with Jesus. Because God has never changed. His expectations for his followers, they never change. What pleases him doesn't change. We serve a timeless God. We need a timeless faith. And so where we pick it up in Hebrews chapter 11 is really where the the writer of Hebrews is now saying, I've connected all the dots for you, and now let me show you something. You have gotten far away from what God actually intended, and in fact, your ancestors had a more... Uh, had a more faithful relationship with God than you do right now. Let me go back and show you that even before they had access to Jesus, before they had a Bible in their hands, before they had a temple built, before they had any of the stuff that you have, they showed this legendary faith in this relationship with God that you can look at and you can emulate. Right? And that's what Hebrews chapter 11 is about. It's sort of like a hall of fame for the faithful. Okay? These are people that the, the writer of Hebrews wants to connect back to these religious Jews and say, they did it right. Look at what they did. Try to be like this. This is what it looks like to have faith. These actions that they portrayed, these are the things that God wants to see out of his people. So we're going to pick it up. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for. It's the conviction of things not seen. For by it the people of old received their commendation. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. And without faith it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. And I think the world has the wrong idea about what faith is. I think sometimes the world, academia, intellectuals, whatever, they look down on people who have faith. And they say things like, I could never accept that on blind faith. Or, you know, that's kind of like a lazy thing for you to believe because you just got that from your family. You sort of inherited that and you haven't really made that your own. You haven't really spent the time thinking about it and working through it and really understanding it. Or they say, oh, that's a trendy way to think. That's not the way that it's always been. That's not the way that it will. And I think some of these things are really misunderstandings about what faith is. And so I want to start by just talking a little bit about what faith is not. And the first one is this idea that faith is blind. That when you have faith that you're this blind person, you're just putting everything else out. And you're just able to take it on blind faith, right? And I think what the, the ridiculous thing about this concept that faith is not blind is that if you look at the verse right here, right, in the, the definition, the biblical definition of what faith is, it's the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. By faith we understand the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. If anything, faith sees what is right in front of you but also sees what else is going on. Right? We see what we can see with our eyes, but we also see there's something else, another sort of spiritual realm of things that are happening outside of what our eyes can identify. Right? The, the writer of Hebrews is basically saying, like, you not only see what is seen, but you see who created that. That didn't just show up out of nowhere. This, this stuff that's all around you, this just didn't just show up one day. This was spoken into, into being by God. It was his words, the very words of God that created everything that you see. This, what you see, wouldn't even exist if it wasn't for the God who spoke them into existence. It's not blind. In fact, you see what's there and you also see why it's there and you see what's going on beyond what you can perceive with your eyes. And I think when you see what's seen and also what is unseen, it leads to this very practical kind of theology. And I'll, I'll give you an example. Ooh, sorry about that. I'll give you an example. Um, I was working with a teenager a couple years back, and he was struggling with 
uh, pornography. And he was looking at links online, and he said, I'll be in my room, and I'll be on something, and there'll be this link, and I'll just not be able to not click it. I just, there it is right there. It's not even, I'm not even like looking for it. I'm not going for it. It's just right in front of me, and I can't not click it. I'm having a hard time saying no or controlling my impulse. And I said you know, to him, I was like, well, you know, that's kind of like a, it's kind of a tough thing. Like, you do realize like God is like everywhere. Oh, yeah, yeah, I believe that God is everywhere. And I said, well, you know, the Bible actually says that Jesus holds the entire world together. Right? If you're a philosophy major, like, does a tree make a sound when it falls in the woods? I don't know, but that place is held together by Jesus, okay? That's how you answer that. They'll drive your philosophy teacher crazy. Like, I don't care, but I know Jesus holds it together. I said, do you really believe that? And he's like, yeah, I believe that. And I think sometimes we believe that. We believe it up here, right? We believe something that's true about God's character. We understand something about him. But I said, so let me just stop for a second. So you're about to click on that link. Jesus is right there next to you in that room. Like if he was physically next to you, sitting next to you in a chair, would you find it so hard not to click on that? Well, no. If Jesus was physically sitting next to me, no, that wouldn't be that hard. I wouldn't want him to look at that. See, sometimes I think we see what's seen and we see what's unseen, and when we have a faith that understands that there's more going on than what we are actually perceiving with our eyes, then our life changes on a daily basis. There's way more happening than what we see with our eyes. And it leads to this, this sort of practical theology where it's something goes in here and we believe it, and then it comes here and we believe it. And there's a difference between head knowledge and what we really, really believe. And I think when you see what's seen and what's unseen, it leads to a life that is lived out differently than if you just saw what you see with your eyes. And I've seen God work in my life through my own experiences. I have a relationship with him. I know because I've met God, I've felt his presence, I've relied on him in times of trouble. I've called on his name and he's been there. He's able to be trusted I see what he's done in my life. I see what he's done in other people's lives, in your lives. Whenever we have a a testimony on screen here, we're seeing what God is doing in somebody else's life. I see people who are selfless, who are sacrificing for the kingdom of God, who are giving what they have to make his kingdom move forward, to build his church. That's not happening by accident. I'm seeing the work of of God happening in the lives of the people that I'm in community with. I'm seeing the work of God happening in my life. This is definitely not blind faith. If anything, we see more. And we have an unswerving belief because of what we see both with our eyes and what we see that's going on beyond. God has never changed. His expectations for us don't change. What pleases him never changes. We serve this timeless God, and we need a timeless faith. I think the other thing that sometimes people will say about faith is that faith is not dumb or lazy, right? They say, oh, it's this lazy faith. You know, you you grew up in this. Your parents handed you off this package of faith. They said, hey, here's what our family believes. Here's what you get. This is your thing. You are blank. You fill it in, whatever it is, Lutheran, Catholic, non-denominational, whatever it is, you know, or nothing or whatever. Here's your package of faith. Now it's yours. I think sometimes people say, ah, it's a lazy way to go about things. You just sort of took it from your family and you just, you never really made it your own. And I don't think that if somebody says that, they have any idea what it means to be a person of of faith because it's a very personal thing. The stuff that we do is born out of the faith that we have, right? And so this is what James says. He says, someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I'll show you my faith by my works, you see that faith was active long, along with his works. And he's talking about Abraham in this case. And he says, Abraham was able to do something incredible, amazing, like just over the top faithful because, and we saw it based on what he did, not necessarily based on what his belief was. We saw his belief kind of sealed in his action. So it says, you see that his faith was active along with his works and the faith was completed by his works. And if you look, even in verse six, right, it says, Without faith, it is impossible to please him, for whoever would draw near 
to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. It's not a lazy faith. It's not something you just take because your family hands it to you. Right? This kind of legendary, timeless faith that God is looking for in his people is something where we struggle and we work and we draw near to and we try to seek and find what God has for us. And we work on our relationship. And we do all of these things not because someone else wants us to do them and not because we feel an obligation to do them and not because I feel like I owe God something, but because I've experienced his grace and now all of this stuff follows along behind because I have been overwhelmed by what he's done for me. It's this idea between an extrinsic motivation and an intrinsic motivation. If I'm doing this stuff because I feel like I have to, I'm missing the boat. If I'm doing this stuff because I have no choice because I've been overwhelmed by the amount of grace that he's poured out for me, that is what faith looks like. And we show it based on the way that we live. The righteous will live by faith. Faith seeks answers. And I find the more answers that you find, the more questions that you have. It's this sort of never-ending process of getting to know God. And let me just tell you, the Bible actually says we'll never understand God completely. So we can continue to seek and ask and knock, as Jesus would say, come look for me and you'll find me. Knock and I'll open doors for you. Ask me for things and I'll give them to you. But guess what? The more you ask and seek and knock, the more you get to know God's character, the more you find out you don't know and you continue down that path of trying to know him and his character. It's definitely not lazy and it's not dumb. You could spend your whole life trying to understand and know God in relationship with him and still not get very far. Still get just enough And our problem, I think, sometimes is the world sees some of us, and potentially maybe all of us at times, who would come and have faith in God and put the fire insurance up on the wall. We say, you know what? I have just enough faith to make sure that I'm not going to go to hell. And then we stop. It's almost like and I, I was guilty of this. As a, as a 12-year-old, when my mom started dragging me to church, I was doing things out of an extrinsic motivation. I was trying to just be a polite kid and show up and smile. And they told me to say a prayer, and I did it because I wanted them to leave me alone. And I put the fire insurance on the wall, and everybody said, hey, he's saved. And there was nothing different about my life, and I wasn't saved. There was nothing different. Somebody who watched me Monday to Friday would have seen no change in my life based on the faith that I had in God because it was based out of fear and it was based out of trying to please a person. It was not based on a relationship with Jesus. And so maybe I met the minimum requirements of faith, but there was no change in my life. There was no movement. There was no growth. And I think sometimes the world sees that and they think that people of faith are doing this on blind faith or that it's sort of this lazy thing or that they haven't really sought out all the answers for themselves. And sometimes they're right. Sometimes we do see that. But the timeless faith that God is talking about, that's not what he's talking about. It's built out of a relationship. I think sometimes, um, like for me, like I'm always seeking out the best deal Right? If anyone here is like a Groupon, one of those Groupon people, I'm a Groupon guy, right? I'm on Groupon. Hey, that's cool. Let me get that. Like, I'm looking for the best deal ever, right? And sometimes, you know, I'll buy something ahead of time or I'll buy it, you know, more than I need because it's an awesome deal. It's also terrible for me to go to Costco, right? Like, because I end up with like 12,000 bars of soap. I don't know. Like, maybe I'll use those eventually, but, (laughs) right? There's just ridiculous, right? And I think sometimes we are looking for the Groupon on faith. Like, I want the good deal. Like, just give me the one where I don't have to do too much. Right? Like, I'll just, just, I want the fire insurance. I don't want to be in hell. I want my spouse to be happy. I want my mom to be happy, my dad. I want my, I'll do this for whatever. And, like, just give me the Groupon. I'll buy the Groupon, and then I'm out. Just leave me alone. And and there's no Groupon for faith. In fact, Jesus says, This is what it's going to take to have faith. 
You're going to need to love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind. There's no discount. It takes everything. And then what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to love your neighbor not just the way you love yourself. In fact, Jesus, when he gives them the new commandment in John 13, he says, you need to love your neighbor the way I am loving you. Jesus went to the cross for his neighbor. And then he says, you're going to have to pick up your cross and follow me every day. And I'm not going to exclude you from hardship. And I'm not going to protect you from all the stuff that happens in this world. There's no group on for faith. It takes everything. I don't want you to be intimidated by that when you're sort of investigating faith, but let me be honest with you. There's no discount. There's, there's no quick way to do this. It's all of you. It's all of you for the rest of your life. That's what it takes to follow Jesus. And we don't want to water that down. It's definitely not lazy or dumb. It's this all-in, all-encompassing faith. And it's intentional. God has never changed. His expectations for his followers don't change. What pleases him doesn't change. We serve a timeless God. We need a timeless faith. And I think the last one is kind of works with this idea of timeless faith is definitely not trendy. If you base your faith on something that is new, it will fade. Faith is timeless, right? And this is what it says. This is what the ancients were commended for. The ancients were able to have faith in God, right? Before they had a Bible, before they had a church service, there was no, there was no temple, they didn't have Christian books or music or Christian movies. They didn't have podcasts of megachurch pastors. They didn't have professors to, you know, lead them. They didn't have uh, seminaries. They had pretty much nothing. No technology. What they had was time to spend with God. And I think sometimes we get tied up in the technology that we have and the resources that we have and all this stuff and we're looking for whatever is the newest, trendiest sort of self-help idea. And let me just tell you, you aren't going to learn anything new in this series. Nothing new. There will be nothing that I will teach you that will be groundbreaking, brand new information. I have not discovered anything that someone else hasn't already discovered thousands of years ago. But... Luckily, our faith does not need to be trendy. In fact, trendy is a television show from the 80s that's awesome in 1985 and is awful in 2014. And you don't want that kind of faith. You want a faith that's timeless. You want a faith that will last for your entire life. And in fact, you want a faith where people thousands of years ago can point back to you and say, this person, they had a timeless faith. Look what happened in their life. We don't need the newest Christian self-help book to get our faith on track. We need a relationship with God. We need to dive into this. There's nothing new here. It's been complete for over 2,000 years. You have it sitting on a dresser at home, and it's waiting for you. And we have technology at our fingertips. We have all kinds of resources. You can Google anything uh, and find an answer. Just be careful who you trust. You've got professors. We've got seminaries. You've got a church to belong to, a community of people. You've got people who have been at this longer than you that could really teach you something. Utilize all those resources, but don't let that get in the way of your relationship with God, and don't let that be the thing that keeps you out of here. Because this is where your faith is built, in your relationship with God and in his word. And it's not trendy. God hasn't changed. His expectations haven't changed. What pleases him will never change. We serve a timeless God. We need a timeless faith.
And so here's what faith is. And in fact, we're going to spend the, the next seven weeks now working through these four pillars of faith. These are sort of the actions of faith. This is how it looks when someone is living out their faith. And honestly, they're going to be different ones in each story that we look at. As we look at Noah, there's going to be one that we like really focus on. As we look at someone else, there'll be another one. But these are the four things that this is what faith looks like when we have this timeless faith and when we're really practicing what it means to be in relationship with God and be growing in our faith. The first one is a hopeful confidence in the promises of God. And this is a person who acts like whatever God says has already happened. Right? God promises something and they act today as though it already has taken place. This is what the ancients were commended for. And this is what it looks like to have faith. Someone who takes God at his word and acts like it's already happened. Number two, a passionate desire to please God. All of the people we're going to look at had this passion to please God. It's sort of this piece of faith that we must have in order to be able to follow through and grow. The third one is an obedient action regardless of circumstances. You think of a guy like Noah who's building a boat in a kind of a ridiculous fashion for over 120 years. Right? That's an obedient action regardless of his circumstances. And the last one is holy reverence for a big God. And I think all of them had probably all four of these, but some of them had a little more of one or the other. And think about all of these are actions, right? A hopeful confidence, a passionate desire, an obedient action, or a holy reverence. These are all actions. Wait, when our faith is working and when we're growing and when we're in relationship with God and we trust him and we believe him, and when he speaks to us, we act. Our faith is sealed by the actions in our life. And all of these things we're going to see in the people that we're going to look at. But all of these things should be evident in our own lives as we grow in our faith. And I think this final idea is why is this so important? Why is faith so important? And I can't stress enough that this might be the most important thing that you can focus your energy on especially while we talk about it for the next couple weeks. Look at verse 6. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. That might be all I need to tell you. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. And I started to think about, I mean, the word faith is used hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times. The amount of things that are tied to faith, I literally could use a whole, we could go through a whole month just looking at some of the things that are tied to faith and barely get through any of them. So I wrote kind of a very succinct statement and I cherry-picked some of the best things that are tied to faith. And I want you to understand, faith is like this foundation. And when you have it in your life and it's working, the whole house that's being built, your relationship with God, who you are, the stuff that's going on in your life is, is plumb. It's straight. It works. Okay? It keeps the rain out. It makes sense. It's not, there's no frozen pipes. Okay? But when we don't have the foundation of faith set exactly right, the whole house starts to be off kilter a little bit. And we start to see cracks. And we start to feel drafts. And we start to see that something's not quite right. And here are just a couple of the things that you're that are based upon your faith. Through faith, we are saved, we live and walk, we receive righteousness, we are justified, we have access to grace, we receive the promise of the Holy Spirit, and we wait for Christ's return. And I just cherry-picked a couple of things that are based upon faith. But look at what's at stake. Look at what gets out of whack or off kilter if our faith isn't set right. Through faith, we're saved. We live and walk. We receive righteousness. We're justified. We have access to grace. We receive the promise of the Holy Spirit and we wait for Christ's return. And those are just a couple of the references 
of things that are built upon the foundation of faith. Could there be a bigger place for us to take steps? Could there be a more important thing for us to be paying attention to, to work on, to seek to understand better? It's a foundational element of following Jesus. And I think some people will say, I have a really hard time with faith. You know, I'm just not able to do it. I just can't put my faith all the way in something. And I don't necessarily think that's true for anybody. Because let me just say this. I think everybody has faith in something. I think some of us have misplaced our faith. And we haven't put it in God. And we don't have it in Jesus. And maybe our faith is in our family or maybe it's in our kids, or maybe our faith is that savings account or our retirement account. We know if things go wrong, we can lean on that. Maybe our, maybe our faith is in a cause that you represent, in a scientific method. As long as I can measure it and reproduce it, and you know, as long as it fits in my framework. Maybe your faith is in a misplaced identity, Maybe it's in technology, maybe it's in a medical field, or it's in your cabin, or your stuff, or your money, or career, or academics. You say, this thing won't let me down. I can lean on this when stuff goes wrong. And maybe you put your faith in something that isn't God. Maybe you say, that's the thing that I can lean on when I'm in trouble. And let me tell you, stock markets crash, people fail you, stuff gets destroyed. Those things, they're not things designed for you to put your faith in. If you can't write a check to give away your savings account tomorrow, you might be putting too much faith in it. If you can't give away what you, what you have, you might be putting too much faith in it. Because God says, I want you to lean on me, and I want to be the one who's there for you. And I want to be the one, when times get tough, that you put your faith in. So the question that I want to land on here is, what is your faith in? And is it timeless? Is it something that will be there for the whole of your life, that someone will potentially still be talking about once you're gone, the way the ancients were commended in Hebrews chapter 11. Because God is pleased with timeless faith. The same faith that was on display for people thousands of years ago, one that's not trendy or dumb or blind or lazy. It's an act of faith built through a relationship, and it might be the most important thing you can spend time growing in. God has never changed. His expectations for us, they do not change. He is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. We serve a timeless God, and we need a timeless faith. Let me pray. God, would you help us to look inside of ourselves? Would you help us to take a really long, hard look at our relationship with you? What are we putting our faith into? Why are we doing it, God? Would you help us to focus in on what it means to be a person of faith, someone who's building an intimate relationship with you? We want to be like the ancients who were commended for the faith that they had. We just thank you, God, that you want to be in relationship with us that you desire to know us, that you desire to draw us in. Would you help us continue to connect with you, to know you better, to know your character, to be able to trust you, and to grow our faith. In Jesus' name, amen.